away, please. Tim, let's go. Okay, if everybody could get back in and take their seats, we will get started post haste. Hey, Mary, look out there and see if the commissioner is wandering around, please. I'm sure there are too. Jonathan will not be here. I see Jack and Betty are back. Anybody? May I ask the commissioners to please take their seats and we'll get underway. I think we can go ahead. We'll turn now to Commissioners Dominici and Peterson for our final presentation on the recommendations of the Reactor and Fuel Cycle Technology Subcommittee. Uh, Pair, I understand you'll make the presentation. Senator Dominici is not able to be with us, but we thank him as well as you uh, for the work that you've done, and you may proceed, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you can see by our subcommittee, membership, we were fortunate to have a highly qualified and prestigious group of people to work on the important issues that we were charged with. Uh, Senator Domenici is my co-chair. Our subcommittee also consists of Al Carnesall, Susan Eisenhower, Allison McFarland, Richard Meserve, Ernie Moniz, and Phil Sharp. I, I really am saddened that, uh, well, I, it's too bad that Senator Domenici has not been able to join us today. He, he became ill and was not able to travel, make the travel back from New Mexico and wish him a speedy recovery. I just want to say that it's been a unique opportunity to be able to work with him. And I think that, that he has a deep belief in the capability of this nation to solve problems. And he's expressed that consistently, and I'll try to do that as best as I can here, too, and to represent the, the, the things that he, he would also, I think, say. But again, I regret that he's not here to, 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 to join in with us. This subcommittee was formed to answer the call right here of the charter, specifically to evaluate existing fuel cycle technologies and R&D programs in terms of multiple criteria. And our charter then goes on to say that the criteria of evaluation should include cost, safety, resource utilization, and sustainability, and the promotion of nuclear nonproliferation and counterterrorism goals. I'd also like to note that our commission is clearly not comprised to be a technology commission. Instead, we, we are comprised to be a policy commission. So we're not making recommendations for any specific reactor technology or reprocessing technology or anything of that nature. Instead, we've focused our efforts on a policy framework under which these technologies might in the future be developed. And so that's, that's the, the, the principal goal that we have. Now, 
Additionally, this commission's focus on policies for managing the back end of the fuel cycle. In addition to that, we've also addressed closely related question of whether any currently available reactor and fuel cycle technologies or any commercial technologies that are now under development have the potential to change the fundamental nature of the nuclear waste management challenge that we confront over the next several decades. <laughs> Given these key questions, we went about our business in a combination of ways, holding public meetings and deliberative meetings and embarking on several site tours. We held three public meetings to hear from invited speakers and to receive input from interested members of the public, one in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and two in Washington, D.C. Our first meeting was held in Idaho Falls where we heard from the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy, Pete Miller, where he discussed the DOE's nuclear energy R&D roadmap and several of the DOE's nuclear R&D programs. We also heard from EPRI regarding the status of nuclear R&D programs in the private sector. At our first meeting in Washington, D.C., we covered a variety of topics from commercial technology options for reactor and fuel cycle technologies to the role of local communities and governments should play in the development and demonstration of new nuclear technologies and their key safety, environmental, and security concerns. We also covered issues with the U.S. manufacturing sector and the labor force's ability to support new reactor and fuel cycle technologies. Our last meeting in Washington, D.C. focused on waste management implications of fuel cycle technologies and the international nonproliferation and security implications of these fuel cycle choices. Uh, we did have classified briefings on some of the key topics there. In total, we heard from more than 50 different witnesses, and all their testimonies and presentations, along with the videos of the meetings, are posted on our BRC website. We also held three deliberative meetings of the subcommittee. One was a teleconference and two in D.C., where our members were able to voice their opinions and concerns and debate the big issues at hand. And I look at Ernie right now because he has contributed consistently with many helpful suggestions. Um, I think that it's also a good point to, to mention the What We've Heard report that was issued and the value of the feedback that we have received from that. and asking, repeating back what we have heard and then checking to see if it's largely correct is one of the fundamental things that has improved nuclear plant safety because it is a practice which now occurs routinely. It's called three-way communication and I think that it's important that we've attempted to do it here as well. Now members of our subcommittee also toured several nuclear sites of interest and got to learn not just about the facilities but also about the people and the communities that have been involved with them for years as well. Okay, the sites we visited included Hanford, Savannah River, Idaho National Laboratory, and WIP. Members even visited fuel cycle facilities and met with politicians, community members, NGO representatives, and government representatives in France, Japan, and Russia. So, in the process of our work, we came to two central conclusions that set the context for the recommendations that I'll present in a moment. Our first central conclusion is this. Advances in nuclear reactor and fuel cycle technologies may hold promise for achieving substantial benefits in terms of broadly held safety, economic, environmental, and energy security challenges. To capture these benefits, the United States should continue to pursue a program of nuclear energy R&D and D both to improve the safety and performance of existing technologies and to develop new technologies that could offer significant advantages in terms of the multiple evaluation criteria listed in our charter, those things that are important to our society. Our second, if I can get, there we go, that's good. Oops, oh boy. Uh, uh, conclusion two, there we go. Our second central conclusion actually can be phrased in a couple of different ways. One way, the first, is that no currently available or reasonably foreseeable reactor and fuel cycle technologies, including current or potential, re or potential reprocess or recycle technologies, have the potential to fundamentally alter the waste management challenge this nation confronts over at least the next several decades. Second, put another way, we do not believe that new technology developments in the next three to four decades will change the underlying need 
and requirement for an integrated strategy that combines safe interim storage of spent nuclear fuel with expeditious progress towards siting and licensing a permanent disposal facility. There is no doubt we're going to need a disposal facility regardless of what we decide to do on the fuel cycle side. And this is particularly true of defense high-level waste and some forms of government-owned spent fuel that can and should be prioritized for direct disposal at an appropriate repository. It is important to note that our central conclusions stand independently of any conclusion one might reach about the desirability or feasibility of closing the nuclear fuel cycle in the United States. The subcommittee simply could not reach a consensus on this issue. As a group, we concluded that it is premature at this point for the United States to commit irreversibly to any particular fuel cycle as a matter of government policy. Rather, there is a benefit of preserving and developing new options. Our d, &D should continue on a range of reactor and fuel cycle technologies that have the potential to deliver societal benefits at different times in the future if and when technology advances change the balance of market and policy considerations to favor a shift away from the once through fuel cycle, that shift will be driven by a combination of factors including but hardly limited to its waste management impacts. In fact, safety, economics, and energy security are likely to be more important drivers of future fuel cycle decisions than waste management concerns per se. Given what we've just said about our central conclusions, our subcommittee makes the following recommendations. The first one being that the U.S. should provide stable long-term RD&D, that is research development and demonstration, support for advanced, fuel, advanced reactor and fuel cycle technologies that have the potential to offer substantial benefits relevant, relative to currently available technologies in terms of safe safety, cost, resource utilization, and sustainability, the promotion of nuclear nonproliferation counterterrorism goals, and waste storage and disposal needs. I should also mention that while our recommendations are focused towards the federal government, that industry also performs a very important role in research and that we should note that the Electric Power Research Institute, for example, also uh, uh, should continue its efforts in uh, supporting research on these types of technologies. We believe that a well-designed federal RD&D program should be attentive to the opportunities in two distinct areas, one being on near-term improvements in the safety and performance of existing light water reactor technology as a part of a once-through fuel cycle, and in technologies available for storing and disposing of spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste. The second being on the longer term efforts to advance potential game changing nuclear technologies and systems that could achieve very large benefits across multiple evaluation criteria compared to current technologies and systems, such as fast spectrum reactors capable of continuous actinide recycling and that use uranium more efficiently, high temperature reactors that can supply process heat for hydrogen production or other purposes small modular reactors with novel designs for improved safety characteristics and the potential to change the capital cost and financing structure for new reactors as just a few examples uh, of, of several that merit effort. Our second recommendation is one of concurrence with the recommendation of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology on the U.S. Energy R&D funding. I note that uh, Commissioner Moniz is on the President's Council and has been deeply involved in developing these specific recommendations. We agree about the need for better coordination of energy policies and programs across the federal government for substantial increase in federal support of energy-related research, development, demonstration, and deployment, and for efforts to explore new revenue options to provide this support. Specifically, the recent PCAST report endorsed an earlier proposal by the American Energy Innovation Council to provide $16 billion in annual federal support for energy technology innovation, an increase of $10 billion per year over current funding levels, with all of that increase coming from new revenue sources. It is important to note that the subcommittee is not making a specific recommendation regarding the federal funding levels, regarding future federal funding levels for nuclear energy R&D, RDND. 
And also I should again note that the industry role in our d and investment is also very important and I would believe merits increase as well. Our third recommendation is a portion of the federal nuclear energy rd and resources should be directed to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that is the NRC, to accelerate development of regulatory frameworks and supporting anticipatory research for novel components of advanced nuclear energy systems. We believe that an increased degree of confidence that new systems can be successfully licensed is important for lowering the barriers to commercial investment. We recommend that this effort receive 5 to 10 percent of the total federal funding for reactor and fuel cycle technology RD&D. Well, 5 to 10 percent would represent actually a relatively small fraction of the total federal investment in nuclear energy RD&D. It would amount to a large increase in the amount of funding devoted to developing an improved regulatory framework for nuclear, new nuclear energy technologies. And if we look at things that have been happening recently with small modular reactors, the value of having a regulatory framework in advance is very clear, and we think this should apply also to more advanced technologies for reactors and fuel cycle. Again, it is important to emphasize that this funding would not come from licensee fees, but be received as a portion of the total federal RD&D funding for nuclear energy. Our final recommendation is that the United States should continue to take a leadership role in international efforts to address global nonproliferation concerns. This could include, for example, support for multinational industrial scale fuel cycle facilities, joint efforts with other countries to improve security and accountability technologies and protocols for nuclear materials and capabilities, and improvements in existing multilateral agreement frameworks. Our subcommittee also heard a variety of views on whether and to what extent U.S. fuel cycle decisions and policies have influenced fuel cycle decisions made by other nations over the last several decades. Whatever view one has about the past, the subcommittee believes that it is important for the United States to play a leadership role in the technological and diplomatic efforts overseas, both via the U.S. nuclear community's involvement in international fuel cycle RD&D and commercialization efforts and through U.S. participation in international nonproliferation and nuclear security regimes and initiatives. Additionally, the subcommittee recognizes the importance of continued development of modern safeguards and security technologies for application in existing facilities and in combination with safeguards design approaches for new facilities. That being said, while our subcommittee did focus on fuel cycle and associated technologies, we clearly recognize that the goals of nonproliferation and nuclear security cannot be achieved by primarily technological means. Rather, success in this area depends on the effectiveness of diplomatic arrangements to strengthen the current nonproliferation regime, such as a broader adoption of the International Atomic Energy Agency's additional protocol, promoting policies, technologies, and fuel cycle choices that reduce proliferation risks while also taking steps to improve the security of nuclear materials and facilities and more effective use of bilateral nuclear cooperation agreements. These are the major recommendations from the subcommittee, and I would again like to thank all of the subcommittee members who have participated constructively and more so even those members of the staff that have provided tremendous support and worked in uh, developing the, 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 the draft report material. And finally, to all of the members of the public and the other stakeholders who provided an enormous amount of helpful input to us. I'll open the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Excellent. Uh, we'll ask if any of the subcommittee members have any comments to supplement. Uh, Ernie? Uh, yeah, just a couple of comments. Uh, the uh, uh, one is that uh, uh, just to put an exclamation point on what Pierre said in terms of recommendation number one, that this does include uh, you know research in terms of LWR reactors, et cetera, new fuel forms. That you know, I mean, the text will will elaborate that. 
the recommendation itself does not does not highlight it. So I think we just need to emphasize that. And then in that context, I would just add the one thing that, uh, again, I think the chairs uh, should carry the burden, uh, is that uh, I think we do need to have a little reexamination post Fukushima uh, as to how the portfolio might shift uh, somewhat. Okay, thank you. Any think, other subcommittee? Uh, Susan? <clears throat> well, speaking for myself here, I would just add one thing. I, I, uh, I have served on this committee, but I note that uh, U.S. leadership, since this is a commission on the United States position, tends to focus on continued leadership in nonproliferation efforts. Uh, I personally would like to speak up for U.S. leadership in innovation um, and in the research and development phase of this. Thank you, Susan. I, I, I think that it's important we, we know that in many areas, the U.S. has slipped behind other countries in terms of nuclear energy technologies. But it's interesting to note, for example, in the area of reactor technologies, that uh, the technology that is emerging to be the most commercially successful, arguably of any, would be the passive safety technology. And certainly in the post-Fukushima environment, We'd love to see plants that have that type of capability to operate without external source of power or heat sink. Uh, that, that this is a technology that emerged out of the United States and arguably only the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission could have uh, uh, licensed this technology because of the fact that it requires a high degree of scientific technical capability to perform the independent evaluation of that type of system. And this is one of the reasons why a principal recommendation from the subcommittee is that we need to invest more in directly into NRC to develop that type of capability further for these more advanced technologies that we're looking at. And that may be one of the things that could contribute to reestablishing U.S. technical leadership in, this, in, in these areas. Uh, let's see, Dick, and then Ernie again. Dick? Uh, Two quick points that are really intended to just reinforce some things that uh, Pierre covered but didn't emphasize. Uh, one is on his recommendation one, which I think is the crucial one for this report. Um, he emphasized that one should be thinking about these technologies in terms of safety, security, economics, you know, sustainability, terrorism uh, issues, waste storage. Though that's all true, and certainly I concur in that. Um, one thing it isn't ex explicitly stated in the recommendation that I think will be in the report, that it's important to look beyond isolated in making that evaluation. It's important to look beyond an isolated segment. And it's often we talk about reactors and their uh, benefits in one way, one way or another in these, in these uh, various dimensions. We need to think about them in an integrated system that the reactors are not in isolation. There's a whole fuel production system, maybe there's reprocessing, there's certainly disposal. That's all uh, has to work together. And so you need to look at optimizing on these various characteristics across the whole scope of the activities. So it's complicated, but if you sub-optimize, you look at just one piece of it, you're going to miss the whole picture and maybe hurt yourself in terms of the other components. Uh, second uh, comment I'd make was on the fourth recommendation is that uh, sort of reinforce one point which was to look at this in terms of the nonproliferation objectives across the fuel cycle. There's a lot of uh, conversation about uh, and efforts on and important efforts on uh, dealing with the proliferation of enrichment facilities uh, which because of concern that the enrichment facilities if scattered around the world would themselves give you the access to at least the technology that could be used for producing weapons, usable material. There is the same problem on the back end of the fuel cycle with regard to reprocessing facilities in that because uh, of the separation of plutonium that could be used for weapons and that those two things are tied together and in fact there's advantages in tying them together and that, uh, that a, a country that uh, sees that there's an integrated system where it doesn't need to worry about fuel cycle, therefore is given some extra incentives to not engage in them, and that does help in achieving our nonproliferation objectives. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the subcommittee as well. I have a question about recommendation number two, with which I uh, agree in general, but it does strike me as 
one of these things is not like the others. Uh, this is a recommendation about general investment in energy technologies, and I don't, it's not that I can't see any connection, but I don't understand why we would be recommending more or less investment in wind or solar or coal or anything else. Why is it not uh, specifically about nuclear technologies? I think it uh, harkens to what Dick just observed, that we should think of this as being a system. The nuclear part is being a system, but it's certainly not a system that operates in isolation of all other energy sources. So in some sense, I think that, that one of the reasons why the subcommittee did not, has not really coalesced around a specific recommendation for nuclear RDND is that it makes sense probably to um, uh, view nuclear energy in the larger context of other energy sources and their environmental problems, sustainability problems, and safety problems as well. I certainly personally feel that, that, that that's, it's, it's a good thing to do. But I think your point is important in that it merits uh, additional work and consideration as we work towards the final draft. Any further comments? Yes, Ernie. Uh, yeah, uh, two. Uh, one, one is, uh, uh, and actually it may fit into this last uh, uh, exchange, uh, is um, in some way, but especially in the context of the DOE uh, light motif uh, of the day, uh, I think we should emphasize that it's not in the recommendations, but that I think the subcommittee as a whole uh, felt that the 2009, I guess it was, DOE technology roadmap was, while it may lack some implementation details, was a step in the right direction, uh, and it really broadened the agenda uh, to be much more strategically aligned, uh, including things like LWR work, waste form work, uh, all the things that, frankly, had been missing for quite some time in the program. And I, I, I think the subcommittee was, was uniform uh, in that. Uh, the second point I would make is, is going back to this proliferation uh, uh, discussion, uh, I think there's been, a, I think there's a, frankly a bit of a gap uh, overall in terms of uh, how the, the commission as a whole can discuss some of the institutional and policy issues of proliferation more broadly since, again, we, this subcommittee was more on the technology uh, side. We heard a presentation at one of our meetings from the Department of State uh, I found rather unsatisfactory uh, with uh, a rather set of ad hoc actions that do not add up to a policy. Uh, and, um, and I do think that does impact our charge. And so I don't know what the solution is, Mr. Chairman, uh, a little rump group or something, but I, I do think we need somehow to grapple with these broader issues of proliferation. Yeah, I would second that. Yeah. Thank you. Anything further? Perry, I think you got off a little easy myself. <laughs> that is a very, very good report. We thank you, and please extend our thanks to Senator Domenici as well. Mr. Chairman, I, I, Mr. Chairman I, I think it's because nobody told him that he was supposed to have seven recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Perry. That completes our formal agenda. We'll turn now to the public comment. Before we do, I want to remind everyone that the recommendations that have been discussed here this afternoon and this morning may or may not be adopted by the full commission. And we will now integrate the work of the subcommittees and the views expressed here today into a draft report for public release at the end of July. Uh, we'll now turn to public comment. Uh, we're very pleased that we have 16 persons who have indicated they want to make a statement to the committee. Uh, the first one will be Robin Reed, NFWL, and I'll ask uh, her or him, is it? I'm not sure. Thank you. Yes, would you do it from the podium? We can uh, hear it a little better, I think, if you do it from the podium and it's connected to the, um, the video. Uh, 
and she will be followed by Tom Cochran of the NRDC. Uh, please proceed. You have three minutes. Now, may I uh, emphasize to you that you will be keeping a clock on you here, and when the yellow comes on, they have how much time? When the yellow comes on here, you have one minute left, and when the red comes on, your time is expired. I'll be very careful about my time, for goodness okay. sakes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robin Reed, President and CEO of the National Foundation for Women Legislators, now a 73-year-old organization of over 2,000 elected women officials. I'm delighted to be here. Our, in, our Energy, and Energy and Natural Resources and Agricultural Policy Committee last year passed a resolution that I'd like to share with as many of you as are interested. We, we did mention the fact that the current administration is committed to restarting America's nuclear in power industry, although they've terminated Yucca Mountain re Redepository Project. But we did want to, we were very pleased about the Blue Ribbon Commission, of course. And we, provide, we wanted to provide recommendations for safe long-term policies and programs for managing the nation's commercial and defense use of nuclear fuel and high-level radioactive materials. We support the nuclear power and are based on sound scientific and technical analysis. We, we support innovative technology as well that will en enable the United States to once again lead the world, the work in these technologies. We did send our, re our resolution to the President of the United States, and I did have a response from him as about, that, about that. The Secretary of U.S. Department of Energy, members of the Blue Ribbon Commission, and all the leadership in Congress. I do want you to know that within 12 hours of the, of the Gulf oil spill, I had 72 calls from among our 50 states of women who wanted to be on a blue ribbon, our blue, own blue ribbon task force to work on energy policy. We feel that this is very, very important for all of our states. And whereas many of you think that perhaps some of our women are not as supportive of nuclear energy, I beg to differ with you. Perhaps you can look at our resolution and you'll understand how supportive we are. I hope this will be helpful to some of you in your, as you'd like to report out about how the women of the United States, women leaders of the United States feel about nuclear power. I leave this with you. I think I was under my three limits, right? <laughs> I did try to hurry, but is there anyone that would like a copy of our resolution for their own uses? Yes, thank you very much. We will indeed take the resolution. I do want to say many of you know that Anne Rydalch Representative, Dave Ann, Representative Ann Rydelch from Idaho chairs our commission. Many of you may know her as well. She's been very involved in energy policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be Tom Cochran. Uh, Mr. Chairman and commissioners, uh, your three-minute time limit prevents me from telling you what I like about your findings, so I will um, tell you what uh, my problems are. The Fukushima accident raises uh, more than a dozen serious concerns about operational reactors and their safety and uh, the uh, management of uh, spent nuclear fuel. Thank you. you were asked by the President to address how the nation should manage and dispose of spent fuel. You've ducked several of our recommendations and rejected one. And as I understand it, uh, this is primarily on the basis that you claim to be a policy committee and not a technical committee. Thus, you, uh, in your failure to address these technical issues, you have essentially left it to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to resolve these issues, such as how fast we should move spent fuel out of pools and into dry cast storage, whether you should have hardened dry cast storage or not, whether you should move spent fuel from operational reactor sites to a consolidated interim storage. Uh, 
contrary to at least some of you, uh, I have no confidence in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's ability to review its past practices with respect to the lessons learned from Fukushima. And I could go into some detail about that, but not in three minutes. Uh, therefore, I'm asking you as a committee to, to call upon the president to write the president and ask him to establish a technical review committee to review the lessons learned from Fukushima independent of the NRC staff and commission review. I support the commission's review, the staff, NRC staff's review, but you cannot expect them to review their past practices and come up with the best recommendations for this country. And uh, I think in particular with regard to spent fuel management, the waste confidence rule gets in the way uh, it's used by the NRC and licensing board to prevent the public from raising issues in related to spent fuel management in licensing of existing and new reactors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom Cochran. Dan Brown will follow. Uh, excuse me, Ernie. Uh, Tom, there have all, uh, on this question of reviews, uh, there have been in Congress a number of calls for other kinds of reviews, uh, including, for example, National Academy. Can you comment on that vis-a-vis -vis your own proposal you just made? Well, I think the, the Academy would, would be useful uh, if, that's all, if that's the only option. I, we've asked for a, a commission along the lines of the Kemeny Commission. As you recall, after Three Mile Island, there were two independent reviews established, both the Kemeny Commission and a, uh, a review by the uh, congressional staff, and I think both of those served a very useful service, and I think the nation would be better served if we followed that example with respect to Fukushima. I'd simply point out we had three core melts at Fukushima. And there are 23 reactors in the United States that are of a similar design. Eight others have a Mark II instead of a Mark I containment. So 30% of our fleet is similar to these Japanese reactors. This was a serious problem, and it deserves serious national attention. And if you're going to duck the technical issues, we need a technical review committee independent of the NRC to uh, uh, review these lessons learned. We're not going to get the service we need from this commission or the staff alone. And you have a Thank comment on, uh, on EPA uh, rulemaking? Well, <laughs> we've had this discussion on, on uh, citing repositories. Uh, I, I would urge, that as part of your recommendations, that the licensing criteria for the repository has to come before the selection of the sites. Uh, otherwise, as we saw in the past with respect to Yucca Mountain, uh, the agencies uh, that are concerned, EPA, DOE, OMB, Justice, go into the back room and they massage the criteria to ensure the licensability so we, of the site. We, we actually say that in okay. the report. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cochran. Dan Brown is uh, the next speaker. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to blow through this as quick as I can. Um, uh, in our sec your second meeting last year, this, this commission was originally impaneled as, uh, to deal with U.S. nuclear, U.S. used fuel. And uh, in your second meeting, I made a, some brief comments, and I said we really should look at the global issue because global events affect America. Um, and I think Fukushima has amply proven that was wise. Um, it's affecting our environment. Shortly after uh, the, the incident at Fukushima, uh, people were reporting low levels of radioactivity detected on the West Coast. Uh, it's affected our industry. The, popular, the public opinion in the United States dropped when there had been something like 70 percent support for more nuclear power. It dropped. 25, 30, 35 points within two weeks. 
and, and the nuclear industry had been working for years to build up that confidence, and it just went poof like that. Um, we have to deal with climate change. We need a relative value of how much conventional uh, sources of energy are costing us and the risk that they entail compared to nuclear power. And, and for instance, the ash spill down in Tennessee, there's more radioactivity in that ash spill than there would be in a nuclear accident. Um, we've got in, in Abu Dhabi is developing new reactors now, uh, built by South Korea. And there's no plan that I know of to dispose of the spent fuel. And that could be a problem for us here in the United States. Uh, and more than anything else, the public opinion issue is driving silly decisions like the German government deciding to shut down their whole nuclear industry. I doubt if they're going to get hit by tsunamis or 9.0 earthquakes in Berlin. Uh, so it was a political decision not based on science. And most of the opposition in the United States has been, over the years, has been based on public opinion more than scientific validity. Now, somebody mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, with siting commission, you have to have an approval from the local community. It's not just a matter of the local community. Um, you know, Fukushima is affecting us here. Yucca Mountain, there was more opposition from people that didn't want the stuff shipped through Chicago or St. Louis or Omaha on the way to Yucca Mountain. There was more opposition from the transport question than there was from the people of Nevada. Um, uh, Bruce Power in Canada attempted to ship parts of a, of a decommissioned reactor through the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway over to Sweden a few months ago, and they didn't notify and get the approval of intermediate communities, and the result was the, those communities went berserk when they heard about it, and, and every newspaper, every reporter in Canada put it on headlines that, you know, nuclear waste shipped through St. Lawrence Seaway and Great Lakes. And then the media went out and interviewed people that knew nothing about the issues, all of whom were anti-nuclear. And uh, I've talked to people in the industry in the States here that were really angry at Canada. Um, on the question of revenue, of, uh, of funding, I don't, I'm not sure the, the uh, funding really exists. That the, fund is, the money has been put into the general fund, and I don't think it's readily available. We should try and find a way to pay for used fuel through future revenue. Um, I don't think, that after Fukushima, I don't think the American people will approve any waste facility or interim facility anywhere in Canada, in the, in the United States, rather. We need a pragmatic solution that the public will support. Okay, that's it. Thank, thank you very th much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brown. Next will be Judy Trichel, and uh, she will be followed by Mr. Makajani. My name is Judy Treichel. I'm from the Nevada Nuclear Waste Task Force. I'm concerned that when you had your reports about Fukushima that they were um, sort of downplayed with what's going on. I know that the news has sort of dropped the issue, but I disagree with Mr. Kokaiko that there was um, increasing and growing stability. I don't think there is. And one of the questions that I wish that you had asked or that I would like you to take up is why the uh, release standards or the allowable doses have been raised to the point where school children can receive the same or greater dose as a nuclear worker. Um, I think this is going to lead to huge problems in the future, and I think it's one of the things that you need to look at because it certainly does show that the problem is a very, very large one. Um, I also don't think that we should be referring to this as an accident. Uh, it may be in this case, but certainly nothing after this case. As Tom Cochran noted, we have the same kind of reactor here. We have the same sorts of problems here. There are problems that have been pointed out for a long, long time and nothing was done about them. So if something happens in the future, it's not an accident. It's that we weren't careful enough and we didn't do what we should have done before that accident occurred. And I guess as a final point, we'd be more than happy to take all the money in Yucca Mountain, but we do require that every truck coming in be examined very carefully. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Macchiant, Johnny. And he will be followed by Mr. John Perry, Jr. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm Arjun Makijani, President of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Um, I must say you could have been uh, a little better served by your briefings about Fukushima. I was a little bit shocked to hear that the NRC did not know how much spent fuel there was at Fukushima and couldn't give you a relative assessment of what there is here, so let me give you a little vignette anyway. Uh, this information is public by the Japan Atomic Industrial Forum since March. Roughly 50 tons in Unit 1, roughly 90 tons in Unit 2, uh, or 300 tons, I don't know whether I got Unit 2 and 3 mixed up, about 240 metric tons including the core in Unit 4. When you add all those up, it is less than in the spent fuel pool of Vermont Yankee alone, which was relicensed without requiring dry storage in the middle of this crisis. I think the NRC is doing a shocking job, and I think their response to your questions about dry storage, uh, well, I, since I can't think of any kind, polite ways to say it, I won't. Uh, the, uh, I, I think the public is not being well served. There are many obvious lessons that could have been learned on day three. I issued a spent fuel pool warning on the 15th of March or the 14th of March, I think, uh, before TEPCO. Uh, there are lots of lessons to be learned. One among them that is obvious is there are about a one out of every hundred light water reactors that have ever been built has now suffered core damage. That's a shocking number, and I think you ought to take into account before you recommend that we ought to continue making plutonium just to boil water, because that's what we're doing. All right, I was disappointed that documents were not public before this, so we couldn't read your reports and comment on them and have to rely on slides and impromptu, especially as we are restricted to three minutes. Uh, I was happy to see, let me say something positive, I was happy to see that waste classification is proposed to be uh, revised. Uh, I do agree, as a Hindu I can tell you I'm well qualified to say we don't have a classification system, but we have a caste system for waste, according to origin. So, so I'm, glad, I'm glad that it is proposed to be revised. I am not confident that performance standards will be properly implemented. Uh, performance standards are very flexible. In regard to deple depleted uranium, the NRC staff did a performance assessment in which they said there would be no erosion at an unspecified generic site for one million years. And then during the public discussion, of which a transcript is available, the author of this report essentially said it was silly to do that. And the NRC's own expert also said it was silly, and then we all agreed that silly wasn't an appropriate regulatory term, or something equivalent to silly, I can't remember the exact word. I can tell you that in the, in the licensing technical document for the Utah Enviro Energy Solutions waste site, there is a number that says that Utah can dispose of more uranium than the weight of the earth per gram of Utah soil, I testified to this under oath in 2004 at the same time as the government, NRC, and the company said, the licensed applicant, said that it was a scientifically sound report and to date it has not been corrected, nor have I been corrected. I believe the nuclear engineers around the site, you can see how many kilograms 10 to the 37 picocuries is and arrive at the same conclusion pretty seven pretty ease off of uranium-238. Your time has expired, Mr. Marchioni. I think I have zero confidence in the, in the ability of the establishment to do sensible performance standards, given that for seven years they have not changed the document that says we can dispose of more uranium than the weight of the earth per gram of Utah soil. Thank you very much, Mr. Marchioni. I understand Mr. Perry is not here, uh, called to the microphone Catherine Fuchs, and she will be followed by Jeff Fettis. Hello. Um, first, I just want to thank the Commission for the concern they've shown over the incidents at Fukushima 
um, I'm heartened to hear that a lot of these recommendations are going to be further investigated in light of what's happening in Japan. Um, and I wish that I got that same feeling from the NRC. Um, so I'm representing the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability, which is an organization of 36 groups around the country who live downwind and downstream of weapons production facilities, um, waste storage sites, and reactors. Um, I cannot claim to represent everyone in the communities affected by, um, by nuclear waste and uh, spent fuel, uh, but we do have a very diverse coalition, geographically diverse, economically diverse, different backgrounds. Um, and they've all, they all function on a consensus process and have decided that hardened on-site cask storage is really the way to go until we find a solution for disposal. Um, I just wanted to reiterate why we see this as um, the way to go. Um, first, there's the realities of consolidated interim storage. Um, is it fair? Um, I'm not sure that it can be, because if waste is being produced all over the country, brought to one location, is it really the responsibility of that one community um, to accept the waste created elsewhere? Um, we don't think it is. Uh, we think that the communities that create the waste have a responsibility to deal with it. Um, additionally, I'm not sure how it's politically possible to get a, a community to take interim waste when there's not a plan for a permanent um, solution. Um, we, you know, I know that we're just trying to put a way forward and not specific details. This isn't a siting commission, um, but it, this is a reality that we're going to continue to run into. Um, so perhaps the permanent disposal and interim storage really do need to be looked at together. Um, finally, um, I just wanted to mention um, the cost of transporting waste. Um, earlier, um, someone mentioned that uh, we can look at the European model and how safe they've been able to transport waste. Um, I think that's great that they haven't had an accident, but I would like to point out that the European railroad system is much more advanced than the United States railroad system. Um, you know, there's never been a single fatality in, um, in all of France's railroad operations. Um, we may not have the, the same record. Um, so there will be a lot of investment required um, for transportation if we decide to go with interim um, consolidated storage. Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Fuchs. And uh, the next speaker is Jeff Fettis. He will be followed by Kara Colton. Thank you for having me. Um, I've set my stopwatch so I can stay under the three minutes and also see if I can have time to say something more supportive, like my boss, Tom Cochran. Uh, Commissioner Lass uh, stated that his subcommittee coalesced around the four basic concepts, need for disposal, a geologic repository with a new process, and a new entity. That I am supportive of, and as is NRDC. However, Commissioner Rowe also noted that shortcuts are what's gotten the process into trouble, and we, we might express it a bit more bluntly, but we also agree with that. Let me suggest a key and specific recommendation that must be in your July report, and certainly in any final report, if you want to achieve what you've set out to achieve, which is a transparent, workable process that arrives at siting and development of a geologic repository, which, importantly, isn't just a geologic repository by fiat, but engenders public trust and confidence. Amend the Atomic Energy Act to no longer treat radioactivity as a privileged pollutant. Specifically, I'm talking about the exemptions of radioactivity from our clean water and hazardous waste laws. As several of you have noted in your questions today, throughout the process, the, the current situation is not working, and not just in terms of funding, although that's its own discussion. Even more importantly, in terms of authority and process, and uh, Commissioner Lash specifically noted that the subcommittee struggled with the idea of how it defines meaningful oversight for states in our federalist system to protect public health, but also to avoid what he, did, what he termed, and I wrote this down, constant interference with whatever new entity is created. And I don't really know what that meant, but you know, we only have three minutes. You can suggest new methods or ideas on public engagement all you want. Uh, and while it's welcome, and we certainly will appreciate it, any consulting process that states have in what you suggest in going forward is going to remain at best the half a loaf or really I would suggest a quarter of a loaf that what Nevada had and what they ran into trouble with. Un until such time as states can set cleanup and other protective standards for water, land, and air that they can enforce via RICRA, 
the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act or the Clean Water Act with the attendant citizen suit provisions, you won't get that public trust and buy-in. Let me be clear, I'm not suggesting a state would be the licensing regulator of a geologic repository or the EPA would not be setting radiation protection standards because I agree with that basic division of resources. Rather, once there's a, rather, I, I'm, I'm suggesting the states can actually say, for example, there is a um, disaster along a transportation line or at an operating nuclear facility or at, God forbid, a proposed nuclear facility. Until such time as those states can actually set cleanup standards and regulate them, you will never get the buy-in until they can regulate such releases are, and they'll never know what the bargain is. So. In conclusion, unless and until you recommend that Congress do away with these anachronistic exemptions, you're not going to get the public trust that you're looking for. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kara Colton from the Energy Communities Alliance. ECA is the organization of local governments that are adjacent to or impacted by DOE activities. Many of our members are some of the communities that have expressed an interest in hosting future nuclear facilities. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's been great today to hear words like inclusive, transparent, open, consent-based, negotiate, clear rules, that there's an interest in defining interim and what that means. Um, and that there was a recommendation to take the time and provide resources to ensure that the concerns of the communities are heard from the communities directly from themselves rather than just assumed. Um, I want to speak to you very briefly and submit for the record a letter that ECA submitted earlier this month to Secretary Chu. We asked that DOE review the safety and security of defense-related high-level waste and spent fuel storage in light of what happened in Japan and as the NRC reviews domestic nuclear power facilities and spent fuel uh, storage practices. More specifically, we've asked Secretary Chu to review the impacts on local communities of long-term storage of defense related spent fuel and high-level waste, and to analyze the cost and impact of cleanup budgets on storing and securing this waste at DOE sites. In order to ensure the health and safety of local communities, the safety and security issues must be reviewed, not only because of what happened in Japan, but regularly. The findings should be reported publicly. This would be helpful to build trust amongst DOE, local communities, and with the public. In regards to the impact of cleanup budgets at DOE sites, ECA is concerned that cleanup funding is being used to store and secure the defense-related high-level waste and spent fuel. This could prevent essential cleanup activities from being completed. Funds used to manage high-level waste at DOE sites were cut in, 20, in 2011 and may be cut further in 2012. The costs associated with storing and securing waste can be significant and may well grow, and they're coming out of the cleanup budgets. To ensure future storage needs are met while these issues are being discussed, the disposal issues, new facilities are likely to need to be built. For example, uh, storage facilities at Savannah Riverside and Hanford to store the vitrified waste that was originally destined for Yucca Mountain. Securing these new facilities are going to add an additional cost. Another example um, of the impact of budget cuts after WIPS budget was recently cut, the Carlsbad City Council voted unanimously in an emergency session to return 3.5 million in DOE infrastructure funds in order to help protect about 80 jobs at WIP. Uh, this leads to another ECA recommendation, and that's that the administration consider to, sorry, excuse me, begin the dialogue with communities now on developing interim storage, especially while we have and before we may lose experienced workers uh, due to these budget constraints. Thank you, and I'll submit the letter to the record. Uh, Ernie, uh, this question, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I, I understood something at the beginning of your, of your remarks. Did you say your organization includes a number of communities interested in hosting? That may be sites? interested in hosting future facilities, yes. Can you name them? <laughs> I mean, I, I, We're not I, a siting commission. I could commission. name them. I'm not sure I should name them. But I mean, so, I mean, Carlsbad, one of our members, for example, has expressed interest in, in possibly hosting future sites, you know? Uh, <laughs> Uh, the letter you referred to will be part of the record. Uh, Michelle Boyd is uh, next, and she'll be followed by Michael McLay. Thank you. My name is Michelle Boyd. I'm with Physicians for Social Responsibility, and I uh, presented to you on your very first meeting, the very first day that you all met, 
And what I presented was the principles for safeguarding nuclear waste at reactor sites. And I'm highly disappointed to not see any reference of this in your summary of what you've learned from all the public input. Um, this document calls for safeguarding the waste, hardening the waste at the waste sites. It's signed by 100, over 170 organizations from all 50 states. This is what the communities that live near these sites want. They do not, they do not, let me repeat, they do not want to move the waste to some willy-nilly to some interim storage site. They, the, there is disagreement, there isn't agreement about permanent disposal and how we go about doing that, and I think that that's a really important piece that the commission is, that you're, that your commission is looking at. But to try to claim that the lesson from Fukushima is let's move this stuff faster than ever is, is completely missing the point. It took nine years from the time that the agreement for PFS was signed by the, um, by the leader of the Goshute tribe to the time that the NRC gave the license Nine years. Are we going to wait nine years to deal with the lessons of Fukushima, which is that overpacked pools are dangerous? That lesson, we, don't, we know. We don't need to wait for a final NRC 90-day um, review to know that that is a serious problem. And so what the communities around these sites want is for this waste to be dealt with. We want the security threats to be dealt with now. And that should be your number one, absolute, your number one um, recommendation. And we're very disappointed to see that it's been completely glossed over. Um, and then earlier this, uh, later this, early, because earlier this year, we sent a letter on, and we presented to you on February 2nd um, with another 70-some groups laying out the reasons why we oppose interim storage. If you continue down this path, you will have a lot of community groups fighting you tooth and nail every step of the way. If you go down the path of saying, okay, let's deal with the real security threats and let's involve the public in that process, you will have more cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle Boyd, and now Michael McLay. I'd like to call the attention of the committee to uh, the report from um, Oak Ridge National Laboratories on molten salt reactors, history, status, and potential that was uh, published in 1969. Uh, if you read the last concluding paragraphs of the intro of this, of this report, it basically talks about how the molten salt reactor technology could be configured as either a converter or a breeder, which means that you could use it to actually burn nuclear waste, um, turn it into something other than something less toxic and has a shorter half-life, um, much more easily um, disposed of, um, and also much smaller. So instead of looking at the um, waste fuel that's been piled up as a, a waste, we can move it back over into the fuel column and fuel these kinds of re reactor technologies. These reactors are um, basically passively uh, designed, so uh, they automatically shut down if um, something goes wrong with the system. As a matter of fact, the way that works is there's a tube that has a, a piece of frozen sol uh, the solvent that is in the, the liquid uh, reactor. It's frozen in a tube at the bottom. If the power goes out, that tube dissolves and the liquid all just goes down into a tank below hand, below, below the reactor. So it's a, a very nice design. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the engineers at Oak Ridge who designed this and the physicists uh, basically did this every weekend because they didn't want to stay around for the reactor on the weekend, so they turned the switch off on the fan. The um, plug would melt and the stuff would go into it. So it's been tested thousands of, well, hundreds of times anyway. Um, it's a very nice, simple system. Um, now, this re research was conducted, um, well, this report was from 1969, so we've been sitting on this technology for 40 years. And now what's happening? China is investing a billion dollars in this technology because they got our reports off of, uh, well, a website that has all the reports on it, and they're going off to Im implement this technology. So we could replace the current technology with a breeder um, converter reactors that could be converted into breeder reactors and burn up the fuel um, that's sitting on, um, in as waste right now, burn it up as fuel instead. So that's basically the, the other thing. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, you missed a really great opportunity yesterday. The uh, Energy Thorium Alliance had a meeting, a conference here, where we talked about this. Um, I think with you were there. Um, and uh, it was a really um, in interesting meeting. Of, uh, it's a, a really vibrant community. Uh, Kirk Sorison's in the 
audience, he's got a website called Energy from Thorium. I think he's given a talk um, presentation before this committee before. And I em emphasize this is technology that could solve problems instead of having everybody sit here saying, well, what are we going to do about the problems? Build these reactors to burn the um, fuel. Um, we get more energy out of it instead of putting in a hole. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McLeay. Mr. Michael Conley. Uh, to be followed by Mr. Robert Orr, Jr., Mr. Conley. Good afternoon. I read, wrote something. I'm just going to read it. I'm not a public speaker, so please bear with me. Nuclear power isn't the problem. The problem is with the reactors we've been using to produce it. If the reactors of Fukushima had the liquid fluoride thorium reactors, they wouldn't have had a disaster on their hands. Liquid fuel reactor technology was successfully developed at Oak Ridge National Labs in the 1960s. Although the test reactor worked flawlessly, the project was shelved, the victim of Cold War technology. Excuse me, a victim of Cold War strategy. I said I'm not a public speaker. A lifter is a completely different type of reactor. For one thing, it cannot melt down. It is physically impossible for a lifter to melt down. And since it's air-cooled, not water-cooled, it does not have to be located near the shore or near any water source. It can even be placed in an underground vault. A tsunami would roll right over it like a truck over a manhole cover. A lifter uses liquid fuel, not solid fuel. Nuclear material dissolved in molten fluoride salt. Fluoride salt is like table salt, only different. It's a salt. You melt it, you put it in the thorium, you now have a liquid fuel. Conventional reactors are atomic pressure cookers. They use solid fuel rods to superheat water. That means there's a constant danger of high pressure ruptures and steam leaks. But liquid fuel can always expand and cool off. It's walk away safe. Because lifters don't use water or steam. Instead, they heat a common gas like CO2 to spin a turbine for generating power. So if a lifter leaks, it is not a catastrophe. The molten salt spills out and cools off, quickly becoming an inert lump of rock. The entirety of the fuel can be recovered and put back in the reactor once the reactor is repaired. It does not go into the environment. Uranium is water soluble. It can be carried away by river or the moisture in the air. You're, but the fluoride salts in the reactor do not react with water or air. They are inert. It can be recovered. Big, big difference. Think about it. Lifters burn thorium, a mildly, reactive, mildly radioactive material as common as tin. It's found all over the world. We're all, we've already mined enough thorium to power this country for 400 years. That is not an exaggeration. It's the waste of our rare earth element mines, which, by the way, are closed now because China is mining rare earth and refining it and selling it to us. We go hat in hand to them for our rare earth to run our missile systems. That doesn't sound very good to me. Lifters consume fuel so efficiently that they can even use the spent fuel from other reactors. Ma'am, the spent fuel from other reactors, lifters can burn them and utilize it as fuel. Spent fuel is unutilized fuel. Will these work? Let's build one and see. That's all I'm asking. Let's build one and see. And those that say we shouldn't build it, they should advocate us building it so we can make fools out of ourselves in front of the whole world. So let's just build one and see. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Conley. Mr. Orr. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Robert Orr, Jr. I'm a retired attorney from Franklin, Tennessee, a member of the Thorium Energy Alliance. I was here for the same conference that's been referred to. A lot of my thunder has been stolen, which makes my job a lot easier. I represented clients in front of judges and juries for 35 years, and uh, now as a retired attorney, I only have one client, and it is by far the most important client that I have ever represented or ever expect to represent, and that client is clean, safe, cheap electric power for the future furnished by molten salt reactors, specifically the lifter that's already been referred to. I don't have time to go through the, uh, the manifold benefits and superiorities of molten salt technology because we're not given enough time. 
Uh, Senator Alexander, our senator from Tennessee, in July of 2009 proposed something that he calls a, a blueprint for 100 new nuclear reactors over the next 20 years. That is a marvelous, marvelous idea. He has it right. But as uh, Mr. Connolly pointed out, he is advocating existing solid fuel technology that is, which, by, by the way, is in every nuclear reactor on Earth. And that's what's given us Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and now has given us Fukushima. The differences between solid fuel reactor, the reactors of the past, the 60-year-old technology that's done pretty well, but not well enough, and the, the new old technology, which is only 50 years old, as we've heard about with uh, Alan Weinberg and his brilliant scientists at Oak Ridge, and that's molten salt technology. Um, it will address virtually every problem that you can identify associated with solid fuel uh, reactor is solved and solved forever by molten salt technology, the lifter. Now, the reason we are members of this uh, uh, organization is to spread the word, to educate people who are against lifter technology either don't know about it, and that's what we're trying to, uh, to, to solve, but if they do know about it and they're not in favor of it, then it's everyone's job to ask why. Why are you not in favor of it? And then listen very, very, very closely to the answer, analyze the answer. I can virtually guarantee that the answer that you hear will not solve the uh, electricity problems for the rest of the world and for the rest of history in a clean, safe, abundant, cheap way. Lifter technology will do that. The Chinese are developing it. While, while y'all are sitting right here, the Chinese are working vigorously and aggressively to take this technology away from us. And then, as Mr. Connolly pointed out, when they do that, we're going to have to go to them hat in hand to get it back. It, it's our technology. It's sitting on a shelf. There are scientists at the University of Tennessee today who would like nothing better than to dust that technology off, start where it ended, and I think sincerely within 10 years we could shut down every coal plant on Earth. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Orr. Mr. Bennett, Brian Bennett is next, and he will be followed by Parker Griffith. Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate being here today, and I appreciate those kind words about staffers, having been a staffer. I'm a retired colonel in the Air Force with four assignments at the Pentagon, which is sort of more assignments than any uh, self-respecting pilot would want to admit to, but, but it was important work, and, uh, and I, I believed in it. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, that this commission has worked hard and worked honestly and openly uh, dealing with the problems that you have, and that is dealing with the nuclear material waste uh, that is out there. Uh, my concern is that I didn't see anything in the report that addresses trying to avoid that much nuclear waste. I too am, uh, am astounded by what I have heard and learned about Lifter, the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. And I saw some of you kind of smile when it brings up, and that, that does concern me a little bit. I'm not sure what you've heard. We can study endlessly various things. My first assignment out of Air Command and Staff College was in doctrine, concepts, and objectives. And we were known for these esoteric pieces that had a four-year study followed by a five-year study followed by a few nuances here that went on to something. But also that came out with new leadership out of that. General John Pouste came in with a make it happen kind of an attitude. And out of the doctrine shop came the A-10, the airplane A-10, which we have in the inventory today for close air support. It's been a tremendous asset. So there are things that, that studies uh, can do if there's a focus uh, put to it. I would like to see if this, this commission to recommend to DOE or DARPA or someone to take some hard looks at the uh, liquid fluoride thorium reactor. Uh, pr prove it wrong. I've heard some others say that. Uh, what are you hearing about lifter that's not? What are you hearing about the molten salt reactors that's not there? But what I am also hearing, and if you haven't heard this, that a PhD out of Drexel University of Fine School uh, is heading up the Chinese uh, uh, lifter program, molten salt reactor program, and he's very well connected with the Chinese family. Uh, if I know that and you don't, I, I would be concerned, especially if we're talking about American leadership in something. If lifter consumes 99% of the nuclear material, 
consumes 99 percent. It only has 1 percent left over. Instead of a light water reactor that consumes 1 percent and has 99 percent left over, that would certainly seem to me to make the, the, the problem of finding safe nuclear storage a smaller problem, uh, at least, uh, in volume, if not anything else. Uh, I, would, I would ask this, this commission to please take a look at something that is safe, something that operates in one atmospheric pressure, it's not going to blow up on you, that is passively safe and that if, if it does lose power to it, the freeze plug uh, and the thing uh, blows out and it just, it, it just melts into a, uh, a vessel of salt, it's passively safe in other words, that there are a lot of attributes that there are people who can talk to you uh, and perhaps challenge some of the other things you may have heard about it. And I would ask that that, that be done and DOE take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Bennett. We now have Parker Griffith. He will be followed by Diane Darigo. I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly, but I apologize if I've mispronounced it. Uh, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. I'm uh, Parker Griffith. I'm a radiation oncologist by training and a former uh, congressman in my district was the uh, district that created the Saturn V. And so we uh, believe that America can solve this nuclear problem that we have. It's, uh, when I listened to the committee today, it reminded me of all the seminars I sat in on lung cancer. And then we went out in the hall and smoked. I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, <laughs> I think we've got to get a hard, hard, hard look at, 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 at the technology that's available out there. I think the molten liquid and the uh, thorium uh, technology is, in fact, um, workable. But I do think we have to take a Sputnik attitude toward it in the sense that we're not now on a global stage communicating with China, India, and others, and so there's not a lot of time for us to be king of the hill and assume that China is going to wait on us or allow us to catch up with them. So we need, we need direction. We need, uh, we need an executive uh, command to put, I think in 1962 when Dr. Seaborg responded to President uh, Kennedy uh, about nuclear power, he mentioned thorium. And um, I believe that it's an answer. And I think we have to put a full court press on to prove it or disprove it. Because right now, right now, we're turning our nuclear energy resources into a chronic sore or a chronic illness. We need to look for a cure. We're putting Band-Aids and Band-Aids and casts on, and we're responding to a crisis in Japan, and we'll have another crisis down the road. We're a nuclear community. Browns Ferry came through the massive tornadoes very well. I compliment TVA, and, uh, <laughs> and they've, they've been under the gun quite a bit. We know we can do this, but we cannot do it unless we really feel threatened. Sputnik threatened us. We're being threatened now. If China becomes energy independent, they rule the world and we will still be in the Mideast 10 years in a country, 11 years in a country, all about hydrocarbon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, now Diane Darigo. And the final speaker will be following her, Alex Canara. Diane, I'm not sure I pronounced you your it. name correctly. You got it. It's okay. Diane Darigo. I'm uh, <laughs> with Nuclear Information and Resource Service. And... Uh, I wanted to uh, express disappointment with the failure of any of the committees, particularly the disposal or the uh, transport and storage committee, to acknowledge the agreed-upon statement from over 170 organizations for um, hardened on-site storage. That would be an interim storage step that could be taken without transport. Um, I mean, the technical concerns we presented, um, we expressed our technical opposition to this in a presentation in February. But the message today is, that we're hearing is that that was completely ignored. And part of the problem with uh, 
proceeding with what to do with nuclear waste has been ignoring what the public legitimately cares about and is concerned about. And so I would uh, repeat what others have said, but reemphasize that if you want to involve the public, if you want public support, you can't take our advice and then completely ignore it, not even address it. So this is just a draft, so maybe in the final we'll see some expression of um, an opinion about the concern, the recommendations that, that we've made. Um, it, it seems like it, we were concerned about the, we are concerned about the uh, lack of balance on the committee and what this recommendation appears to do is to simply provide a way for the liability for the irradiated fuel to be shifted clearly to the taxpayer. It, all it does is to set up a, another site that's a target, that's another um, facility that would have the risk of environmental or safety or security uh, risks and add to it the transport risks. And uh, it, there's no real advantage. In fact, there's the disadvantage of the transport risks and the, um, the additional site or sites that would be the interim sites. So if you proceed with this, you're simply repeating the same mistake as has been made over and over in nuclear waste siting. And we will have more comments um, when we review in more detail. Mr. Could Chairman. I, sorry. Could, could yeah. I just make a, an indication? I, I appreciate the, the comments, and it's true in our verbal comments. We did not reference uh, the document that so many of you work so hard on. Mm -hmm. But uh, in fact, in, uh, well, unfortunately, this is we're ahead of uh, ourselves in terms of what we've released. But in the draft report already, I assure you, there is both reference to your document and reference to the arguments that you folks make about the transportation question if you go to a, uh, um, a, a consolidated storage as well as to the Haas proposal. And while you may or may not, we did not reach the same conclusion you reached, we clearly, uh, and I'm sorry we didn't uh, say so verbally, uh, acknowledged both the arguments and the, um, the, the document itself. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, the, the point really is... Oh, no, I understand you it, really care also, about the substance, but... Well, no, I certainly care about no. the substance, but also part of this is dealing with the public. And, and so, okay, so you'll dismiss us later in writing, and you didn't dismiss us yet today in writing. I'm, that, I'm just no, no, I, expressing I, that this is something that was hard-pressed, hard-fought for. Um, I was one of the biggest dissenters myself to some pieces of it, but we are in agreement on it that you can't, we've got an immediate danger at our facilities, and we've got a faster way to deal no. with it than having any kind of siting program. I understand I'm not going to argue the content with you, but I, I want to be very clear that we more than hurt you, we actually addressed some of the things, but I regret we didn't say anything so that you and others could actually know that in fact. Uh, Pair, could, could I uh, add one additional question? The, the, one of the major elements of the recommendation is the need to focus on trying to move material from shutdown reactor sites where you have nine and consolidate it to an, uh, a number of sites. And, and in your comments, you did mention to, you know, and, and emphasize the fact that you have multiple targets and this would, in effect, reduce the number of targets. I think it would be very... How would it reduce it? Going from nine to a smaller number is a reduction, but but yeah, but you're not stopping making more at any of them. Um, uh, but again, of course, the the commission's recommendation is to focus the effort on the shutdown sites and mm -hmm. to move that material. I think it would be helpful to have some better understanding of the arguments for and against that, because to me, at least, it's for not the closed reactors. Clear. For the closed reactors, okay. why why material should remain at those sites? rather than being consolidated. And in fact, I'm also skeptical about the wisdom of moving large amount of stuff from operating reactor sites. But the closed ones, at least I can't figure out why it doesn't make sense to try to consolidate that material. And it, 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 it would be helpful to have at least those arguments worked out in better detail. Uh, because it, to me, at least, I think it, it seems to make sense that if you consolidate the material to a smaller number of sites, it does generate less risk. Well, some. Okay. You know, I'm not going to speak for the whole group of 170, but you know, an argument would be that um, if you close them down, you're going to have a lot more um, interest and willingness uh, for people to, to, to do something else with it. But to just move it 
from a facility that's continuing to generate it is um, it's not solving the problem, it's exacerbating it. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dorigo. And the final uh, speaker will be Mr. Canara. Hello, pardon my dress. I uh, had to walk across town to find this place. <laughs> I'm from California, so I don't know much about DC. But I do know how DC takes time to do things. Uh, how many people here, including in the audience, have read the AEC report given to John F. Kennedy at his request in 1962? It's good. Someone has. Very rare event. It's only entitled Civilian Nuclear Power. And it addresses directly the fears that they had at the time that we would fall behind in having energy sufficient for our economy and safety and world power in 1960s. And it specifically outlines what we should have done. And we have not done it. What we should have done, according to the report, was to start with a light water reactor that Hyman Rickover put in his submarines that Alvin Weinberg helped design. Uh, and then, as we move ahead with the breeder reactor program, we would substitute and eliminate these water-based uh, coolant systems, which are giving us all the trouble we now experience, which actually is not that very much trouble. Nuclear power is probably the safest form of mass energy uh, generation that any uh, that humans have ever invented. Uh, certainly the invention of fire 400,000 years ago, or control of it, uh, has not, has a, lot, a large number of casualties. So what I want to know is, is if the commission is actually going to take account of what was said at taxpayer expense to John F. Kennedy in 1962 and review the recommendations, which said by the year 2000 we should have 700 gigawatts of safe nuclear power based on breeder reactors. At the time, they weren't afraid to make plutonium, so they would breed from regular uranium, spent fuel, <laughs> whatever. We don't have to do that. We have a 1,000 years worth of thorium in one mine, 1,400 acres in Idaho. Let me pass between Montana and Idaho. And so we can do the thorium breeder reactor, which Weinberg and the Ornell team worked on for 20 years and perfected and operated for four years in the 1960s. And that reactor is exactly what the son of the president, the former president of China, now has a billion dollars to develop using our plans, all our research, everything that we did as, as an American research institution 49 years ago. <laughs> so even if Washington does operate slowly, 49 years does sound to be a little excessive and that's the point I think we need to make with this commission to whoever's going to listen to this report. Right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Carrera. Thank all of our presenters uh, for their statements this afternoon. Thank the commissioners.